World War II on the Eastern Front was a war like none other, right? It was a war for annihilation. You know, it was in pure Darwin terms, it was survival of the fittest. It was kill or be killed. And so the German Wehrmacht was leading a war of extermination of the Soviet people. And as a result, many, many Soviet citizens were murdered by the Nazis. So it's, it's quite unlikely to think that you know, at any point in the war where so many millions had been like exterminated and villages burned and livestock stolen and women raped, etc, etc, that all of a sudden the, the Soviets would have sought peace with, with the Nazis. And actually, the point of departure within this video is going to be August of 1944. The reason why I'm picking this time is because I think this is probably the most likely time because it was a position at which the Soviets had the greatest level of strength and the Germans had the greatest level of weakness. So before this period, the Germans were still on Soviet soil. After this period, the Soviets would be fighting on German soil. So it's a complete 180 of the events of the war. And so any peace before this period would have given the Germans a, a strategic advantage. Any peace done after this period would have still given the Soviets a strategic advantage. And so this is why I've kind of used this as the breaking point. And, you know, so we're now going to go into the events of 1944 with Operation Bagration. See, I know how to say it now. So Operation Bagration, for those who don't know, was a very, very decisive battle. In fact, I'm so surprised that more people don't know about it because it was the greatest defeat of the German army in history. So just a little bit of context with it. It began on the 23rd of June, which was almost the three year anniversary of uh, Operation Barbarossa, which was the invasion of the Soviet Union. And so it was basically seen as this is revenge because it was covering the same kind of territory which three years earlier the, the, the Soviets had been pushed back at, except now the Soviets were the ones who were advancing and the Germans were the ones in retreat. And what the Soviets were engaged in when preparing this operation was something known as Maskirovka, which is a uh, Russian for, you know, literally camouflage, right? So, you know, basically what they did is they concealed things, you know, like so, so, so troop movements were nearly always done at night. And the only times when, uh, when the Germans were able to see uh, what was happening is as like decoys, yeah? So, so if you had a lot of Soviet troops who were moving a certain way in broad daylight within the eyesight of the, of the Germans, yeah, that was just a decoy because later that night, they would drive back the exact same way with more troops. And the Germans knew that an attack was going to come somewhere along that huge front. They just didn't know where the main assault was going to take place. And many of them uh, feared that it would take place uh, in Ukraine in the south. However, the Soviets planned to strike through Belarus. So by engaging in this Maskarovka tactics, they were able to build up a large number of troops in preparation for this operation. So Soviet General uh, Ruskovsky, um, he was the one who basically was the mastermind behind this operation. And he named the operation uh, Operation uh, Bagration in honor of uh, Bagration, who was one of the uh, great uh, generals uh, during the Napoleonic era. So he died famously at the Battle of Borodino, uh, which was a very decisive battle uh, in the war against Napoleon. So when Napoleon invaded Russia and yeah, obviously this was like in, in homage to him. And one of the main strategic theories that the Soviet army was engaged in during this time was the idea of deep battles. So what you can see on the screen now is a demonstration of it. So what you can see is that the attack comes from various different places and so the enemy isn't able to know exactly where the main assault is going to come. And when enemy reinforcements come to try and plug uh, a gap in the thing, they're attacked by Soviet artillery and by the Soviet Air Force. So then what ends up happening is that seemingly out of nowhere, the main assault finally pushes through. And so as a result, the enemy don't fully know where the main assault is going to come. And so they start trying to defend in one place, then they get smashed there, then they try and fall back and defend another place, etc, etc. So by the time the enemy is able to regain a defensive line, the Soviets already advanced 
and taken a great deal of territory, much more than they would have if they had just done a single operation. So we're not going to get too much into the nitty gritty detail of this battle. Uh, if you want to do that, we're going to have a link in the description because, um, yeah, Soviet Storm, which was really, really good uh, uh, d uh, history documentary uh, all about the Eastern Front. We've got a link there for the uh, video on uh, Operation Bagration, but I highly recommend you watch the whole of that series. And then on top of that, we have Armchair Historian, who coincidentally happened to do a video on this i already had planned like from like last week that i was going to do it uh, like for today but yeah like he ended up doing a video on operation bagratin it was very very helpful for the research for this as well so definitely check out both of those videos so in summary the german army was absolutely crushed uh the different there's different like stats about this we don't know exactly like what the casualty rates were and they kind of vary between different sources what we're going to go by is glantz and haus because you know they seem to be the only people who have figures for both the german side and the soviet side so on the german side they lost 400 50,000 casualties which as I said before is the greatest uh, defeat of the German army ever but on the Soviet side they lost 770,000 so as a result the German army was destroyed army group center was destroyed uh, and they'd cut off army group north and uh, kept them in the Courland uh, uh, pocket which is basically in modern day Latvia and this whole army was trapped there right until the end of the war so in many ways it was a complete uh, strategic like stroke of genius uh, you know they they'd completely pushed all german uh, troops out of belarus and also with some other campaigns which were happening at the same time they were able to push them out of ukraine so in the autumn of 1944 the soviet union had finally kicked out the last nazi troops from their soil so you might say why not just roll on straight to berlin and this obviously is what happened in our timeline however it's something to note that the Soviets had lost a lot of men and between this time and the end of the war they would lose many more men. In fact it's estimated that roughly about 10% of their total like, forces end up being killed during this time. So I don't have exact figures for how many people were killed and how many people were wounded and how people just got sick and how many people were captured and then be end up being liberated. But under the umbrella term of Soviet casualties, Soviet casualties between the fourth quarter of 1944 and the second quarter of 1945, so kind of like the period of September 44 up until May 45, total uh, Soviet casualties represented 1.1 million men. And considering that throughout the whole war they had 11 million, yeah, that represents roughly 10% of total casualties. So it's not insignificant and technically speaking the Soviet army didn't have to keep advancing they'd already achieved their first objective which obviously kicked the invaders out and as far as they were concerned the German army was completely incapable of advancing and you know certainly like was incapable of invading the Soviet Union again and also this coincided with the surrender and the switching of sides yeah of Romania uh, which happened a few days after this campaign and then Bulgaria which also like switched sides as well so the Germans in one big stroke had not only lost all their territory that they had gained in the Soviet Union but also had lost two important allies most important of all was Romania which was the source of their only supply of petroleum so you know how are they going to like fly their planes how are they going to like uh, move their tanks how are they going to do any of these kind of things so without oil the German war effort was eventually going to grind to a halt. For instance, the Luftwaffe was nowhere near as effective as it had been earlier in the war because they simply had like difficulties flying the planes because of this lack of fuel. And a big reason for the war, if you look at um, uh, Tick, so this is T-I-K, definitely check out his channel. It's really, really uh, good. Um, so yeah, it goes really in depth with all this stuff. So definitely check out his thing. Yeah, he says the big reason for uh, Hitler's war aims was to do with oil and so the fact that it was completely cut off at this point meant that it was an inevitable thing that the German war machine was going to grind to a halt. So at this point Stalin if he wanted to could have just said that's it we've done enough we're not going any further. But what would have been the consequences of that? That's what we're going to dive into in the course of this video.